Well, we are, uh, we, we started this prayer course actually a couple of weeks ago when we thought about prayer. So we're actually on week two. And the, the prayer course is what our life groups are going to be studying as well and looking at over the weeks of Lent. And there are a number of things and resources that you can access for the prayer course. We're, we're following in the disciples' uh, footsteps when they said to Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so 24-7 prayer uh, movement that has uh, been started quite a number of years ago by Pete Gregg have a number of resources on their website. Just go to uh, Google 24-7 prayer or the prayer course and you'll get to their website. Pete Gregg has this book called How to Pray. And there are incredible resources on the website and great truth in the book. And so I want to start with a story or a parable that Pete tells in his book, How to Pray. It's called The Parable of the Deranged Greyhound and the Wild Dog Eating Chair. The tranquility of Guildford's picturesque cobbled high street was shattered one sunny morning by the yelping of a dog and a strange metallic clattering. Suddenly, a grazed greyhound came scrabbling around the corner with its whippet tail between its wild legs, weaving between shouting shoppers frantic with fear and hotly pursued by one of those cheap chrome bistro chairs. The chair which was attached to the other end of the dog's lead seemed alive like a dancing snake, weaving and flailing, striking and biting at the terrified animal's rear. Perhaps the dog's owner was still inside, unaware of his pet's plight, innocently queuing for coffee. A movement must have made that chair twitch, which had made the dog jump, which had made the chair leap, which had made the dog scamper, which had made the chair pounce, which had made the dog yelp, which had made shoppers, shoppers shout, which had made the dog run, even more frantically, pursued all the while by this terrifying piece of metal and these crowds of screaming, grabbing strangers. The faster it ran, the wilder the, wilder, wilder the chair's pursuit. The higher it bounced, the harder it pounced. The louder it banged and clanged and zinged on the cobbles. For all I know, that dog is still running. We can all live our lives a lot like that demented greyhound, driven and disorientated by irrational fears, pursued by entire packs of bloodthirsty bistro chairs, too scared to simply stop. And so God speaks firmly into the cacophony of human activity. The master commands the creature to sit. Jesus rebukes the storm. He makes me lie down, as the famous Sam puts it. And of course, we find it intensely difficult to obey. But as we do so, perspective is restored. Terrors turn back into bistro chairs. Isn't that a brilliant parable? In our chaotic, fast-paced world and life with all its demands that seem to pursue us increasingly. The faster we run, the more the increase of the chaos into which Jesus speaks, sit, peace, be still. You know, Luke's priority when he writes that gospel, one of his priorities is the priority of prayer. A moment to stop and be still and be with God. And the way Luke arranges the stuff he writes and the way he arranges his material often elevates the place of prayer in the life of Jesus, and then the call to his followers to elevate prayer to a higher place in our life. Why? Because it's in prayer 
that we get fresh revelation of who God is and we need that amidst all the chaos, the cacophony of noise. And so we're going to go to a, a scripture in Luke chapter 10 where Luke arranges a story about an, an occasion where he's in a home and then immediately after that, the disciples call for him to teach them how to pray. So we're going to begin in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, all the bistro chairs that were all behind her. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help. Now, I'm a doer. I like to be doing stuff. I understand this story from Martha's perspective. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, we'll just pause there. Now, I want you to notice, Jesus does not say, Mary is better. He says, Mary has chosen what is better. She's chosen what is better. To pause, to stop, to be at the feet of Jesus. So it's not that Martha's role is not important or that Mary was somehow lazy. Jesus' point is, it's important to choose to be with Jesus in the place of prayer. So, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. There are things that God does in us in that moment of stillness with Jesus that he cannot do in any other place. Then, he, then Luke goes on and begins to move from this picture, what looks like prayer. Mary, attentive to Jesus, absolutely set on him. Luke then goes in to tell the story of Jesus teaching the disciples. Chapter 11, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be or holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. I love the way Luke has brought these two parts of his gospel together, the picture of Mary choosing to hang on the words of Jesus, to draw close to him, and then Jesus teaching on prayer. It's a snapshot of the intimacy, the closeness of the prayer life. And the beginning of prayer, or the start of prayer, is to stop. To start, we must stop. And that's the bit that many of us find so difficult, because we just can't make ourselves stop. And as we keep on going, we gather a cacophony of noise around us and behind us like the demented greyhound who if only he knew to stop that all of that would settle for a moment. And so in our lives also to start in prayer we must stop, pause, slow down so that all our senses can pause for a moment. We take in an abundance of information through our eyes, through our ears. We smell stuff. We're hearing stuff. We're seeing stuff. We feel stuff. In 24-7 prayer, uh, part of their resources, they have something called Lectio 365. It's an app that helps you enter the place of prayer. And at the beginning of most of the sessions, 
you'll hear these words. And you need to stop. As I enter prayer now, I pause to be still, to breathe slowly, to recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God. That's prayer. It's, I mean, prayer is, it can be on the go and talking to God, but there's something about the type of prayer that Jesus invites us into here that requires a pause so that our scattered senses can, can be brought back into the presence of God and settled and reordered by him. Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. When we stop and we pause and we pray, we acknowledge God's presence and that God is present. I've not got time uh, uh, to read the whole of uh, the story in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah goes into a bit of a spiritual slump. He's been on the mountaintops. He's been in, in battle with the prophets of Baal. And actually, he, he won the battle. Um, they were calling down fire from their God. He was con calling down fire from God Almighty on this for this altar. And um, God answers his prayer. But after this great victory, he goes into a slump. And he's worried about the fact that Jezebel is going to send an army after him. And she promised he would, she would pursue his life and take his life. And so he goes into what can only be described as a, a serious depression. He talks about taking his own life. Now, we don't want to get to that stage before giving God opportunity. But in that moment, God begins to minister to him, gives him rest, gives him food. But as he ministers to him, something different happens. God calls to him, not out of, and many of you will remember this part of the scripture, not out of the wind, a mighty wind came and blew, tore the Mountains apart, shattered the rocks. But then the Bible tells us, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. Then there was an earthquake that shook the place. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then a fire came. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came what? A gentle whisper. A still, small voice from God. And the Lord was in the stillness. And the voice spoke to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, it's a much longer conversation that that question would lead to. But it was in the stillness. And we need to find our way to that stillness. Well then, we move from the story of Mary and Martha into the teaching of Jesus about this type of prayer. Lord teaches to pray. To start, we must stop. But then what do we do when we stop? And this morning we're thinking about the beginnings of prayer in adoration, in expressing adoration and praise to God. So starting by looking upwards to God rather than downwards or inwards to ourself. In response to the request of the disciples, teach us to pray, Jesus. Jesus begins, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy is your name. This was the starting place that Jesus taught his disciples. Now, when I was younger, uh, and I, I just come back to the Lord, I was 19 years of age. Uh, I had a Sunday school teacher. We did Sunday school for all ages when I was a kid, uh, for children, teenagers, young adults, and adults. And in this young adults class, our Sunday school teacher taught us um, that little uh, Oh, I've forgotten what it's called now. It's Acts. 
A stands for adoration, C, confession, T, thanksgiving, S, supplication, supplication, praying for others and other things. And it kind of formed my prayer life. It's rare for me to start into prayer without adoration. A for adoration, C for confession, T for thanksgiving, S for supplication. Someone's really going to have to remind me of what that is. An acrostic, is that what it's called? It is. Oh, my wife's nodding. So whatever Carolyn says goes. That acrostic. And it's a great place to start because what it does is it reminds us of who God is. That's what we've been doing all morning. That sense of praise and adoration for who God is and what he has done. It's a great starting place. Not immediately jumping in to start asking God for stuff, but to give something to God, to give our praise and adoration to him, to give our attention to him, to give our affection to him. The place of prayer is one of relationship. It's not transactional. Um, Lord, here's, here's what I would like you to do. Thanks very much. I'll leave you to it. It's relational. It's an expression of our love to God and then God's love to us. It's a place of relationship and intimacy. We, we don't begin by talking at God, but rather meeting with God. That's prayer's purpose. And in that meeting with him, rather than talking at him, what happens is in this place of adoration and praise, we find that we will be lifted or raised upwards towards God. A fresh revelation of who he is. A new awareness of who God is. Our vision of him will increase. Our view of him will widen and deepen. As we focus on his greatness, his goodness, the bigness of God. I, 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 there are times where in that place of adoration and praise, just expressing my adoration, my love for God, praising him, speaking out who he is and what he's like. There's times where my spirit begins and my heart within begins to go, wow, isn't God amazing? Isn't God great and mighty and kind and loving and wonderfully patient? Wow, my spirit says when I start in the place of adoration place of worship and praise. You know, you, you were created to worship. All, every living being was created to worship. Every human being was created to worship. And everybody worships something. We'll give our life to something. Whether it's worship of our family, worship of material things, worship of work, worship of leisure, worship of money, worship of football, because we were created to worship. And so we all attach our lives to something that gets our priority. But really what we are created for was to worship God. All of us were made to worship. It's just we've misplaced our worship to something lesser than God. We started a recovery church in the East End of Glasgow a number of years ago. And uh, as part of that worship service, we, we always began by saying, the problem with our lives is we've given it over to something other than God, whether it's drugs or alcohol or gambling or sex or whatever it is. We've given our lives over to the wrong thing. We started to worship that, and it has began to demand everything of us when what we were made for was really to worship God. And when we set our worship on God and not everything else, and when we devote our life in that direction, we find life and freedom. Worship, we were all made to worship, but we're all made to worship God. That's why adoration is a great place to start, because it gives us new perspective on who God is. A new enjoyment of God. At the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which I'm sure you all have a copy of at home, but this confession of faith in many ways says humanity's chief end is to glorify God and what? Enjoy him forever. To enjoy God. And so when Jesus begins, our Father, 
who is in heaven. He, he's inviting us into the intimacy of a relationship with the God of all creation to enjoy him forever. And to be honest, the disciples would have been surprised about Jesus' expression to call God Abba, Father, that that phrase of intimacy, Abba kind of is a, is a word that it, maybe a, a, what we would describe as daddy. It's a closeness that a child and a father would have, our father. And although the Old Testament mentions occasional times as God as a father, this was on a different scale. The, the disciples were being told by Jesus, as you pray, you're entering into a new intimacy with God. That's what God's like. We, we sing that song, Good, Good Father, and the, the opening lyrics of that song are, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. You know, one of the biggest problems that people have with, with, with faith and with prayer, they've got the totally wrong picture of God. They think he's something other than he is. Which is why that song goes on to say, but he's a good, good father. That's who he is. And that God welcomes us into this place of intimacy with him to stop and encounter him. And, and praise and adoration is the language of love. Even, even when I'm angry at God or disappointed with God or upset with God or confused by God, I still express my love for him. That's important. You know, when I'm, when, when Carolyn and I are having disagreements or when we're not absolutely head over heels with each other, I still express my love to her. I mean, of course, you understand that's not very common for me not to be head over heels in love with my wife, but, but it's important to, for us to express our love to God, even amidst the disappointment, the confusion of where he is, because all of that adoration widens our pers perspective, our view, our vision, our encounter with God. And as we do, what happens is we begin to become in awe of him. Now, awesome is used far too regularly and far uh, to, to, to describe things that are not really awesome. They're just all right. But to be in awe of God, well, that's amazing. I, mean, I don't know why you've ever had this. Sometimes for people that happens when they're, when they're out in, in the countryside or in the, the mountains or on a, a night where the, the sky is dark and the lights are pinging out. I was telling go, wow. Wow. That God would put all this into place. Adoration leads us increasingly into that place of being in awe of the mighty God. That's a great place to be. But, but also to know the intimacy of this God and his presence. To, to develop and become eloquent, fluent in the language of love towards God, the language of praise and adoration. And when we focus on the wonder of God and who he is, and as we express that love, it, it's like, what happens when, and I think I've used this before, when you're in the opticians and they keep just adding a little lens bit by bit, swapping them over, and then eventually you go, wow, there it is. I can see. Some of the adoration that does that for our vision of God and our sense of his presence. Our Father invited into this place of energy. We need to stop and enter and encounter this in intimacy with our father, Abba. But he's our father in heaven. Adoration is like climbing upwards into the arms of the heavenly father. He's not like any other. And then just settling into who he is. And not only do, when we do that, we don't just see our God differently, we see ourselves differently and our situation differently when we begin in adoration. Suddenly we have a, a new perspective of all kinds of things just by being closer with God. We begin to see and meet the great and awesome God. 
Now, I, 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 I did have a jigsaw with me, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. We don't, have, we don't have time. But if I were to take the 24-piece jigsaw that is in that jigsaw there and, and, and throw the individual pieces away out into the, the congregation, you, you would look at a bit of it and you will get a bit of the big picture. But you would have no sense of what the big picture is. It would only be if I gave you, you know, the frontage of the box that has the picture, and you might begin to get a sense of where it might fit. But actually, you only have a little bit, your bit of the big picture. Our Father in heaven has the big picture. And we have little bits of it in our own little lives, even in our own little congregation. We have bits of it, but God holds the fullness of the picture. He knows all the bits we don't, we don't understand, we're confused by, we're disappointed about, because we don't see the big picture. But there's something about when we come into the place of adoration and prayer and praise, where suddenly our story, our life is caught up in God's story and God's life. And we might not even get to see all the bits of the jigsaw, but we begin to see ours differently. And we begin to see the picture maker and creator in new ways. In prayer, in this moment of adoration and praise, what we are doing is we are acknowledging and then placing our broken, disconnected story into God's eternal, hope-filled story and saying, God, I love you and I trust you. I may not understand it all but I'm bringing my broken story into the redemption of your big, hope-filled story. And in that place of adoration, we get fresh perspective. Let me share an example of this. Uh, we, we've been doing some discipleship uh, courses with the Post Alpha group on Sunday evenings. And Janice asked me last Sunday when there was an occasion um, when through the life group that I was part of or through connection with others, I, I really felt this intimacy with God and God doing something. I, I uh, went to life group one night. It was a, a few years after I had been through surgery for uh, cancer, bowel cancer, had six months chemotherapy. But that's a couple of years on, and I still was living in the shadow of cancer. Those of you who have had surgery before will know that wherever you've had surgery, it doesn't always feel the same in the future as it did in the past. And when you get pain there, you think, oh, oh, what's that there? What's happening down below? How's that? Why am I feeling that? Why am I unwell now all of a sudden? And um, your mind begins to whir. And and think about things that are unhelpful. Is it back? Has it returned? What's going on here? Am I going to have to face something else again? Now, I didn't share this with anyone, but in our life group, um, <clears throat> the, I, I, we had a, a hot seat, which was a, a, you would sit, and then everybody would gather around, and you, they would pray for each other. And so I was in the hot seat. And as I was in the, the hot seat, I, this woman uh, began to pray for me, and she, she used this psalm, Psalm 131. Uh, the words might be on the screen, Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful to, for me, but I have calmed and quietened myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forever. She prayed these words over me. And I immediately knew this was the, the Lord speaking. And what was happening is that my broken, disconnected story that had got all confused because I was in pain and because it took my head to crazy places about what was happening in me. Things that I can't understand. I was making connections that I can't make. I am not an oncologist. I am I'm not a surgeon. I don't know about these details, but I think I do in a moment when I start to do my own thinking. And that's what happened. And, and I, I was going down into a downward spiral of despair, into a broken, disconnected story. But in that moment, what happened was that in those prayers of praise and adoration, as people gathered around me, that broken, 
disconnected story suddenly was consumed upwards into God's hope-filled story where God said, Ian, of course you don't understand all of these things, so don't let your mind go there. And in that moment, what was happening was my soul was being quieted. And I needed some help to do that. So those people in my life group got me to a place that for some reason I hadn't been able to get to myself. But in those prayers of adoration to our Father in heaven, my broken, disconnected story was suddenly settled in God's wonderful, hope-filled story. And I was quieted like a weaned child, putting my hope in God. You see, God is God, and we are not. And adoration takes us upwards towards the God who is God, rather than being left from him. Our Father in heaven. And then finally, hallowed be your name. It's so important to grasp all the intimacy and love and relationship with God. That's that's so important as we think about prayer. But in the end, let's be clear. We are meeting in prayer the mighty living God, the creator of heaven and earth. Everything that we see and everything that we don't see. We are meeting with the sovereign God of all things who reigns over all. We are meeting with the holy, righteous God who is perfect in all whose ways, who sees what we cannot. That means adoration recognizes the otherness of God. I mean, it's wonderful to experience his presence and have that, oh, that kind of lovely loviness. But we're talking about the God of all creation here the sovereign Lord who is all-powerful, the holy God, which means we need to take God seriously. Our Father in heaven, lovely, 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 holy is his name. Hallowed be his name. It's an invitation to take God seriously. We don't talk about it a lot. Maybe we should talk about it more. But I want us to pause and just think about that little phrase that we find in the Bible, which is called the fear of the Lord. Because God is God and we are not. And he invites us into this relationship of love. But that word, the fear of the Lord, that invites us also into a place of reverence and awe and respect and honor and bowing down. It's not the fear that causes anxiety. That that fear, John tells us, 1 John 4, 18, is cast out by perfect love. This fear is something different. It is an honoring of the holy God, a, a holy recognition and awareness of God and who he is. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. There's a, there's a needful bowing of humanity and of our individual lives to the God, the sovereign God. So that when we hear, we'll obey, we'll align, we'll say yes to the Almighty God. On this very thought, uh, Dr. Michael Allen writes this. To fear the Lord is not to quake in our boots, but it's to take God seriously. It's always to have an eye towards God, to his presence, to what he's doing, to his promises and their pertinence for our situation. And so the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom, is that God-centered focus. Wherever we may be, whatever circumstance we may be living, whether it be happy or sad, whether it be life or death, that we would be mindful of God and his presence, that we would be attentive to his word and its promises, that we would remember that he is always the most interesting character in the context. That's what it means to fear the Lord, 
and to have begun on the path of holy wisdom. That whatever the circumstance, the fear of the Lord acknowledges God, welcomes, recognizes him in all his sovereign wisdom and holiness and righteousness. He knows what's best. And so in prayer, that requires a posture of reverence, respect, awe, worship, submission, obedience. A yes, always to God in every circumstance. We rejoice in the holy God of love. We rejoice in the sovereign God who knows all things, the mighty God who does all things. That's what makes him God. He's both imminent, present with us, but also transcendent. Our, our relationship with him, with him is one of intimacy, but it's also mystery. We recognize God's sovereignty by offering ourselves in humility. The greatness of God. And so even when we're struggling our life, we still recognize the greatness of God, the sovereign one, the fear of the Lord, acknowledging him in every way. Even when things aren't going well, we rejoice there always. Philippians chapter four, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. It's good for us in the place of prayer to begin in adoration and rejoicing in the Lord because it, it leads us to expand that understanding of who God is and that encounter of who God is, no matter the circumstance that we are in. There, there's a, a lady in our old church who we still keep in contact with, her name's Adele. And she always has a catchphrase or a story for something. And uh, she, she uh, was telling the story about a, a guy that, that she had met. She, she knew, knew he was struggling and asked him how he was doing. And his answer was a little bit forlorn. And he said, well, yeah, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. And her response was, well, what are you doing still under the circumstances? Get above the circumstances. I thought, that's a fair comment. That so many of us live under the circumstances rather than entering the place of adoration and rejoicing and getting above the circumstances. Being raised and lifted upwards. Well, under the circumstances, I'm doing okay. Get to the place of adoration, rejoicing in praise and the place of prayer so that you can be lifted above the circumstances and receive what comes from the Father. Pete Gregg in his book talks about we need to swap a microscope for a telescope. You know that way, a microscope, when we're just focused on the little jigsaw puzzle we have and we can't even work that out. It's to say, whew, let's turn it into a telescope to see the sovereign God to trust him in the bigger and with the bigger picture. Not under the circumstances, but somehow raised up with him in that place of adoration to come above it. Our Father in heaven, holy is his name. What a mighty God. Worry magnifies the problem Adoration magnifies God. When we're all focused down here, this gets bigger. But when we look upwards in adoration and rejoicing and praising God, we take on new perspectives. So Jesus teaches us, when you pray, say this. How do we begin? Our Father. Wow. Wow who is in heaven, holy is his name. I invite the worship team to come up. Lord, teach us to pray. And in entering pray, teach us to worship and adore you and praise you and rejoice in you. Help us, Lord, not to become so consumed by being under the circumstances 
but instead to allow you to raise us upwards. And that in raising us upwards, we might be able to see a new vision of who you are, a new encounter with you, a new perspective. As we meet you, our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Lord, we submit ourselves to you this morning. We want to say yes to what you say yes to. We want to say no to what you say no to. We want to entrust you with the broken, disconnected, jigsaw piece of our life and say, Lord, I lift this to you and say, I, I, I don't understand all the rest of the pieces, but I give you this. And as I do so, I entrust you with all the bits I cannot see, for you are the sovereign God, the holy God. Hallowed be your name. Let our yeses be to God and God alone. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us, please? And let's worship together.